five fte thank you and thanks to everybody that participated um thank you young joshua for reading the scripture i appreciate that i'm, I'm not sure his name miles miles thank you miles for reading my dear wife for this beautiful song and all of you your presence um i know that you all heard to hear a word from god not from me and we just have to pray that that happens today that um god's is is hard and his people are edified so let us pray dear father in heaven we once again we thank you for who you are we thank you for the wonderful blessing of the Sabbath, and we do come to her word from you. So we pray, Lord, that you will touch my lips like you done for Jeremiah. Put your words in my mouth and edify me and your people, the rest of your people here, not just in this auditorium, but those on Zoom as well. So, Lord, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this wonderful day. Please continue to bless every family represented here, we pray. In Jesus' name, the thanksgiving. Amen. 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 So the topic today is to know God. The process that goes, I go through when, that I go through, excuse me. <laughs> The process that I go through then these um, actually these sermons is <clears throat> this one that is not always just meant for that particular sermon or that particular day. It's something that the Lord's trying to show me. And in the process, I just try to bring that and share it with you, you guys. And the process in this instance was why do we have so much and we are we lack so much? And the answer came with this statement is that we don't always, in Christians, I'm not, I'm not talking to you guys particularly, I'm just talking about the Christian society. We don't always know God. And to know God is the beginning of knowledge. It's, it's, it's what we all need. It's not so much the knowledge of who God is, but to have that connection with God, to, to, to be able to say, like the three Hebrews said, that even God can save us from this fiery furnace. But the other part was, was resonates with all of us all the time that even if he doesn't, we're not going to turn and, and, and um, do this evil against God. So when we look at most of these stories in the word and in the spirit of prophecy, we find that most of the time that God's people went astray, they displayed that they didn't really know who God was. And they had all these, and we often, and even in our own lives, we have things that happen and God showing up and doing miracles for us and helping and supplying us and providing for us. And then when something happens, it's like we don't know who he was. So today, I just want to emphasize this. As much as we want to learn what the Bible has to say as far as knowledge is concerned, we need to know God, because if we don't, we misinterpret, we, we, we stand the risk of misinterpreting what the Bible even says, you know, and the certain words and key phrases that you can make, say what you want it to say. And that all comes because we don't know who God is. The whole Bible is many stories and wonderful lessons in there. The, the, if we don't get the point that, that God's trying to make to us and this whole plan of salvation, this whole thing from the, the time in heaven until now is you have an enemy that's telling you God is this way. God does things this way. He, he acts this way. He has all, term, he has all this, this um, negative energy. 
and God's trying and wants to do it through his people, like he done it through Jesus, to show who he really is, who he really is. So even if you read something that you don't really understand, I looked at the word fear, to fear God, you know, and if you don't understand who God is, you're going to take the fear as a literal fear, like you're, you're scared, you're trembling, you're, you're, he's going to do something terrible to you. But if you know God, you know that fear has to mean something else. It has to mean reverence. If you go and meet somebody important, you know, you, you have that. You don't want to make a mistake. You don't want to say the wrong thing. You don't want to act the wrong way. So this is, this is the, the reason why we have this topic today. Because God's people need to know who God is. So even though we face the same challenges as the world faces, we don't face them in the same way. We don't face them without um, the faith in God that he will do what's best for us. So if we don't show that light, as um, we all know, these, these very easy to remember um, texts and statements, if we don't let our light shine, if we can't solve the earth, then how it's gonna be lit and how it's gonna be salted. So God really wants, at this time in Earth's history, for his people to get it right. If his people could get it right, get, get him right. Get when you get, even when Brother Ian was saying about the, the lady who makes her tunnel vision off of one text, you know, it's a very nice lady, but she's, she's not, she don't know what, because if that's the case, you would make a text you take one text and make a theology out of that. So the whole Bible has to be, be considered when you're trying to decipher through whatever process you're trying to go through in life. So today, I'm just going to go on to the next. Um, right click this too. Oh, this. Here we go. So one of the ways that was brought to me um, is the way we all know about, and this is from Xavier, this on page 19. And can you all see? His name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. The light of knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus. From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. He was the image of God, the image of his greatness and majesty, the outshining of his glory. So we see um, basically what our commission is. Our commission is to look to Jesus because Jesus was the reflection of who God is. So we would know God by getting to spend um, quality time learning the life of Jesus. We're comfortable on that from Ellen White that we should spend an hour, at least a thoughtful hour a day on the life of Christ and especially the closing scenes. Now, when we do this, did I need that? Okay. When we do this, we got to remember that, thanks for making it loud. We do this, we have to remember that God is not um, out of touch with us. He's in touch. He knows each one of us learn differently. We speak different languages and we, 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 we grew up in different types of circumstances. He knows all these things. So building a connection with Christ connects you to God. He is the one that patched up that gap that occurred when the enemy came and deceived Eve. Now we can go and speak one that um, go back to yeah. No back. Back to yeah. So um, basically at the very beginning, as I said earlier. In heaven, the enemy went about making these claims 
about Jesus, about God, that they were up to something and they were, it's not fair and they were being treated unjustly. And he made all these claims and he was so convincing that he managed to deceive a third of the inhabitants. And we all know this story, but it's important that we follow the process. So we realize that God is not, could not, would not use the same, employ the same tactics. He had to show himself to be who he was, the only way he could. And that's through love. And Jesus, the great sacrifice, was the, the perpetuation of that love. That was the sign, not just for us, because a lot of times we think um, it's just about us, but it's not really in the, in the overall picture. It was for every, every piece of creation, every, every created being, every angel, every, every um, other planet that's, that, that was created by God. All of us had to see the true God, the true way. Now, we have a lot of theology in the world today. Some of it, it makes it seem that things are being done, done away with. The law has not, is not binding anymore. Certain things you can do now. You, you, you have a misinterpretation of grace and and um, righteousness by faith, and all these, these words of wonderful words and true words, but we have, now we have the misinterpretation of these things. We have people that don't know God and don't know the process or haven't taken time to know the process that it, it took for him to even decide this long before sin even happened to save us and to, 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 to save us in a way that didn't break his character, that di he didn't break character, that he didn't break the law. The last time I was up there, I said that he didn't break the law <clears throat> when he forgave us because the law was fulfilled in Jesus. So God had to do this in a way that made sure that he maintained his integrity, his, his character, his his who he is. And the principal thing that God always wanted for us was to know. And the word know is like an intimate word. It's not just that you, you read about him, you heard about him, that you have an experience with him. We, we, we heard of Enoch who walked with God. Adam used to walk with God in the cool of the day. So this, this is the type of God that we serve. We serve a God that wants us not just to be able to quote scriptures, be able to sing very well, as my dear wife can, preach. He doesn't want us just to do these wonderful things that are very important, but he wants us to be able to reflect what we have absorbed from him. So to know him is to allow him to make the changes in our lives that we all need. We're not here to, to make loud um, noises with symbols and tink and symbols and, and loud um, trumpets. We're here to reflect what we know from our God. And this comes from an everyday existence. We all have our uh, sets of circumstances. Mine, my testimony is 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 um it's is not just known, but it's very intricate. I was baptized when I was very young into the Seventh-day Adventist Church at age 10 in 1970. And it was a wonderful experience for me. The I didn't know a lot. I didn't know, I couldn't a lot of scriptures or anything like that. But the main thing that I did know was that God through Jesus loved me. It, it, it transformed my life, you know, at a young age. And in, back in that day, 
you know, you're, you're young and you like all these stuff that young people like. And one of the things that was a little task for my brother and I was they used to only have cartoons on Sabbaths back in, in my home country. You didn't have it like today, you could watch a cartoon anytime. Back then it was just that period designed for that. So when we started to, to um, keep the Sabbath, we couldn't watch them. You know, for a 10, 11 year old, you know, that was the test. But I, I, I always thought it worthy because of God's love for me. And I think the part in all of us, in all our, our testimonies and all our lives is that part that's missing. That missing part is what God feels. God feels that missing part in everybody's life. So you're, you're, you're sure of who God is. You're not easily swayed or as, as Daniel, you know, he, he was thrown in the, in the den of lions. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't, it didn't say anywhere where he regretted it. He ran in unwillingly. And we read these wonderful stories and we realize that if we at the time that we're not really like that, we're not got that, that, that connection, even as they as men were. And why not, you know? And the reason might be different for everybody here because we're all different. But I do believe that it's because of the, the position that we put God in in our lives. Now, God is always in one position at all times. And I don't know if you ever imagined, as I have, um, or had even like a, a image in your mind of God on his strength. And if you do, and if you spend time and, and do as Jesus done, you know, just you know, hours or whatever, whatever it takes just to spend time is not just praying and reading, but listening. And you will find out that God is all the things that Jesus was. He wasn't, he's not, and I have a list of, God is not a teddy bear where he's a weak symbol. He's not a warlord where he's quick to war. He's not a trial judge ready to convict you. He's not a tyrant. Focusing. Focus, um, forcing obedience. <clears throat> God is not unfair, making unfair demands. As a matter of fact, can you, can you go to Exodus 34.6? So this is Moses' experience with God. And the Lord passed before him, Moses, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant, abounding in goodness and truth. So this, could you give it there a second? We had to absorb this into ourselves. Reading it doesn't, doesn't really like do the justice that God intended for this, these words to do. These words are God speaking. These words are gonna come and hurt. Staying up there, it's okay, you know it, you can repeat it, you can recite it, you can tell other people, it's very encouraging. But this is what he wants you to get and hurt. So when someone comes to you and has some other theology or some other picture or mirror of God, you can always have this in your heart to know that's not God. And from that point of view, he will direct you to a scripture such as this to back up the claim. So it's important for his people, especially in these last days where you have all sorts of things, even in our own church, you have different viewpoints and different opinions and different um, ways that they decipher the Bible. 
So when you read a scripture like this, this hair has to get in the place that it does what it's intended to do. This has to get in your heart. You have to know the God, that God is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness. You get in the middle of a situation. This is what you have to remember. You have to have that planted in you. If not, it's just going to be words until somebody else reminds you of it. You got to have this. And the, 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 um, could you also go to James 5.11? Now remember this. Take your notes. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, but the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Now, you always look at the story of Job as one of the stories that was heart-wrenching, that was, was most of us wouldn't probably go through what Job went through. But how did Job, of all the people in the world, Singled out by God, remember, God called Job's name. Remember that? That, that? that blew my mind. God actually called Job by name. Have you considered my servant Job? Called him by name. Because you know why? Job knew God. And in, in, the, in the reverse, God knew Job. So he can allow Job or allow the enemy to put Job to the test. How can we, we learn from that? We can learn the lesson by knowing who God is. So the importance of not just studying it for, the, for, for information's sake, but allowing these words to get inside our hearts. That's what it's all about. It's not about us knowing the Bible front and back or knowing the spirit of prophecy, but allowing the words that God's trying to get through to us because he can't force us like the enemy. Now the enemy is gonna make a play to force you to, to, know, to, to accept this and to, to do these things. And you're gonna be in a, in a situation where, am I gonna do this? Or am I, am I gonna go in the fire? Or in the lion's stand? Or am I gonna run for the hills? Or, so this is important for his people. God, these, the Bible was written by his, the, of the people of God, for the people of God, to, so they can be edified. The word of God says that, that's what it's for. You give the Bible to a person that doesn't, they can misuse it. <laughs> it's not that they, they can't, Physically, it's not going to burn the hand or nothing, but they're going to misuse it. They're not going to use it in the correct way. They're going to misinterpret some things that takes the knowing God to interpret. So can we go to Psalms 86, 15? Psalms 86, 15. Now, remember these verses. I've got a few here. But you, O oh Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. The, there's so many of these scriptures in the, in the Bible, but have we developed these characteristics? Have we taken into our own lives compassion, being gracious, being long suffering, being abundant in mercy? being truthful, that is the question. Because we have to be not just knowers of God, but we have to be transformed. God, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you have to be born again. That's what he said. Nicodemus came up with the most logical thing, anybody going to be born again. I'm going to go back into my mama's room. I can't do that. But you have to be born of the spirit. That was the answer. So 
in all the knowledge we gather as humans and be sure and be here, they are as important as that is. In 2 Corinthians 3, 18, would give us something to, to um, put together with this. But we all have unveiled, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord and becoming transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So we see that by beholding, that's what changes you. Get me? By beholding. So let me look at all those characteristics of God and we behold all that stuff, knowing that it ain't in you, it ain't in me. But God is that. By beholding that so much, by keeping that in, your, in the forefront of your mind and your concentration, it changes you from glory to glory into the same image. Yeah, yeah, it, it becomes a part of you. You know, and before you know it, but now this is a spiritual aspect. This is this this science can explain it. This is not science or human nature or nothing. This is a spiritual connection to God, to Jesus, by beholding Him, by beholding all the characteristics that He portrays, all the love and the attention He showed to every single person, coming, being being put to death. While we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, while we were still sinning, those things has to change the heart. Nothing else can change the heart, you know. Do you realize that? No matter how much knowledge you get, it ain't gonna change your heart. You know, no matter how much degrees you get or how much good food you eat or don't eat, none of this stuff changes you, changes your heart, you know. The only thing that changes your heart it's the spirit of God to, to behold that it, it, it changes you. You don't want to defer that they say you fear the Lord is the, is the, um, is, is the, excuse me, but that fear that they're talking about being when you, when you, when you're thinking of God, that it's that awe, it's that unimagined, am I worthy? It's that, you know, in that place, we have the, the, the tax collector and the Pharisee, right? They go into the place to pray, correct? They both go in to pray and the Pharisee stands up front and he proceeds to pray. And he prayed how glad he is and how good he is and how much he fasts and how much he gives and all these wonderful things. The tax collector publican stands in the back. Stands way in the back, you know. Just about, just really in the door. Head down, shoulders down, breathing from his stomach. And, you know, and wouldn't even look up. Forgive me, I'm a sinner. Parable, right? Who ran away justified? Not the guy, the Pharisee that knew the Bible, did all these things, double tied it, all these things that we, we profess. That, that don't change your heart. None of that stuff. The, the publican, the poor tax collector, realized his condition. He realized that he needed a change of heart. So what happened? He went to the place to get the place where he knew he could get a change of heart, correct? We are blessed as God's people. We can come here. We've got Bibles. We give out all this good literature. We do all these wonderful things. But all we in day-to-day -day life allowing this transformation to take place? All we. It's, it's, don't raise your hand or nothing, but this is something that we need to be ready. God is going to, we're going to answer. We're going to answer. Everyone for himself. 
I can't answer for JJ, I can't answer for me. Jordan can't answer for you, you know? So these things are personal. It has to be, I always put it on to, and I know it sounds, it don't sound all that theological, but we have to be serious. We have to really want this because the world is going the opposite way. The world itself, and even certain parts of Christianity, they're not going in the, the way of God. They don't act as if they know God or they don't care. They have gone as far as the Pharisees of old, let's kill him and let's get rid of him. That's, that's, that's where we're standing. And that was, as was said in Sabbath school, that was the, wasn't Christians because they weren't called Christians then, but that was the God's people, God's church, right? That was them, that's the religious leaders. That's who done this. So we're not, nothing new under the sun, as my dear wife likes to say, but we're facing the same thing. We're facing as individuals, not just a church, but as individuals. We're facing all these songs, all these new theologies, all these new ideas, and all these people coming up with that didn't mean that, and this means this. And, and if, you're, if you don't know who God is, you're going to be, you're going to be, yeah, you're going to be all over the place. You're going to be one day over, two weeks later, you're going to be over there. You got to remember that us as God's people need to know who God is. We need to spend time getting to know God. The relationship that we had before the fall has been broken. We had one way, the Bible is clear, and that's through Jesus. So we study about Jesus. Jesus talks to us throughout those gospels. Each day, try to read a little bit about Jesus there. He was intricate, in the in the the way the, the even parables were spoken, he didn't he didn't fool around. He made the point that was needed, and each time we we recognize our position wherever it might be. Now this week, I, I was trying to leave it out, but this week has been kind of rough. We're in the process of moving, and and then I'm preaching, and then other things. My dear wife seeing it and, and like just do things at work and, and the like. And it's been kind of traumatic. No, not to the point of some of you might have had a heart of it. But anyway, this, this was a, a, a time to, to say, you know, I'm going to start taking things into my own hand. I'm going I'm to deal with this situation and I'm going to get this stuff sorted out. And I'm going to do this and that and the other. Or it was a time to say, okay, God, if that's the way you want it, that's the way it's going to be. And I tell you, the latter is the best way. Because even though we were last night at the 11th hour, computer acting up, and all sorts of things, at the 11th hour, a couple of minutes before Saturday, honestly, because I got in late trying to get this thing sorted out, right? Say, let's pray. Say, I take time to pray. Pray. Ah, da, da, da. Then you look, going through, going through. So you, and I always tell myself, you feel kind of foolish, you get frustrated, you, 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 <laughs> you get like excited, but God is, is, it's, it's, it's in those things, it's teaching us. It's teaching us now either you know and trust me or you don't. It's no, it's no in between. It's no, okay, I'm going to let you do this. God wants to be part of, of every part of our life. And when these difficult times arise, and the good thing about being married, and if you marry a good husband or a good wife, they can help you through those times. My dear wife, oh, babe, you know, everything's going to be, and sometimes it's me encouraging her. So 
we have to, as men, pray for our wives. And we have to, as, as, as you guys, as women, pray for your husbands. I just want to put that point in there. But with, with saying all that, it all worked out where God, knowing God, got us through. It got us through a, right at the 11th hour. And, and in your mind, you always think of that 11th hour. Like, God was country at the last. But that last minute sometimes could be nerve-wracking. <laughs> nerve-wracking. So, well, when he does it, uh, oh, again. My, the point that I really want to get, get across is that we have to learn and grow. And we have to learn who God is through Jesus. And we have to grow, allow him to grow inside of us. God wants to put his law, not just on those pages, but in our hearts. So no matter what they say, you're going to be in front of judges and whatever, that you're not moved because they can take your Bible from you. You know, they can take your laptop or, or, or your iPad from you, but they can't take what's already in your heart. So I just want to encourage us to, to get to know God for yourself. Don't take my word or anybody's word for it. It's too precious a gift not to get it for yourself. It's too precious. The, the thief on the cross, people want to wait. You know, oh, I could be like the thief on the cross. Why? You're missing out on all these wonderful blessings that not only come to you, the main thing is that you can be a blessing to somebody else. You know, you can show God to somebody else. That's all part of the gift that has given this church that we can, but we can show it if we remain the same. If we, we get in these theological mindsets and we don't let the heart be adjusted. Most people, the woman with the issue of blood, you know, Jesus stopped everybody. This, she wasn't one of the disciples or nothing, just a poor, sick woman. But he stopped everybody and, and wanted to know what happened. The lady with the mic, she put in a, I don't know, a half a penny or something. She probably, she probably tried to sneak it in so nobody would see. Jesus stopped everybody. Hey, this woman, she put in, and I was looking at it, she didn't put in, a, you know, she didn't put in a mic, I was putting in a thousand or whatever. 500. She put in a mighty, he, he, he didn't stop nobody when they was doing that. When that lady put that might in there, listen to the heart of Jesus. He stopped it. Listen to the heart, not just the story, the heart. He stopped everybody to point out that she put in all she had. You know, that's the, that's the, the digging into the scriptures that, the, that, that God wants us to do. Don't just scrape around the top. And as Sister Lorna was saying about the girl, you got to go digging for that stuff. You want treasure, you got to dig for it. So allow the thing to be a hard moving experience for you. Don't just read it because you, you, you want to know or you want to be able to even preach or, or tell somebody else. Read it so it's going to change your heart. And it will. It will. God has a has a a special way. This thing has been planned before even earth was created, that he can do it. We claim sometimes that we can't stop sinning, but through, through Christ, all things is possible, right? God can do all things, correct? And this is where we're at. We know these scriptures, and we use them every so often, especially when it's for someone else, but it's got to be part of us. It's got to be part of us. If it's not part of us, then we're What's what sound in brass and tinkling cymbals? You know, we're not, we're not where we think we are. We're going to be saying, Lord, Lord, I done all these wonderful things. I said this and I did that. And you know what he's going to say? Depart. I never knew you. So what's important? Get to know God. Not so much all the the kind of the information stuff, you know? So when we read the mercies of God, when he, when he, when he said to, to, to Moses and to us who he was, you know, it's, it's, it's almost to the point where it's, 
a lot of times was, was doing opposite of God's intention because we don't understand, you know, we don't understand. The, 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 we have to be changed. We cannot enter heaven in the sinful condition that we're in. We have to be changed. God has made a way for us to be changed. We've got to accept that way, each one of us. Each person here has their own story, you know, and I went, we've all been through a lot. I had a, a very trying time before I was married to Estelle. I, I lost my previous wife. You might've heard the story before and I'll try to be quick. And I lost her, she, she passed 50 something years old. And I knew her for like 30 something years, but it was traumatic. It was probably one of the most traumatic things that's ever happened to me. And I, she passed it in and the police were the first to arrive. It was a police lady. She came and they, they ushered me, hey, get him out, get him out. So she took me around the side of the house and she was asking me questions and home. Do you want something to drink? You want us to contact somebody? And I, I was a mess. And she asked me a question. She says, what do you want? And I said, I want my wife back. She says, well, I can't give you that. So I was there crying on the wall and on her shoulder. And a thought came to my mind. Now Bermuda's a little island, surrounded by water, the Atlantic Ocean. And I envisioned myself going over to the, to the North Shore side, getting in the water, and just swim. Don't look back, don't come back. Swim in the, in the middle of the Atlantic, right? This was my plan. And then God said, what about me? And I said, well, God, you gotta help me because I can't, I can't help myself. And all the things I'm learned had to be put into practice. All the things I'm said had to be put into practice. I had to trust God. So on that wall, I said, God, I, this one thing that I really want, I want not to feel like this for an extended period of time. I felt like half a person. I didn't, I didn't have no, no hope. And there you have it. Three months later, I was better. It was a process. I cried every day, every single day. I'll go with my brother to work and we had to pull over sometimes to let the traffic go and then stop and I'll run. I couldn't even say goodbye sometimes. I'll slam the door and run up the hill crying. And one of the things I remember is saying, even though this bad thing has happened, this terrible thing has happened to me, God, you're good. You've always been good. You've always been good to me. You know, and this was, this was my cry. I'm crying, 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 but that was my cry. So I got a phone call um, one evening and the head elder wanted to come to sit with me. And he came and we sat out on the porch and he was, he was concerned. You know, you would be concerned. And he thought that I might go out there and looking for something else to, to relieve my suffering. And you know, I get nowhere. I said, well, you don't have to come to church. If you know, you could, take, you could take some time more. And I didn't want to do none of that. So, my, my, and I'm just gave you my experience. My experience, it was, it was a time that I hope none of you have to go through. But if you do, go on. God, I was going away the, next, the following year. And I, was, I knew Estelle, and I was blessed to be good in the same church. And I too, and people were asking me, girls, like, how oh, you can get married again? I said, I don't know. I know nothing about that. I'm leaving all that to God. And I told God straight, I ain't going to other churches. I ain't going nowhere. If, if you ever want me to get married, it's got to happen right here. And we only had a certain amount of people. So anyway, Estelle. Right. 
she lost her husband, right? About eight years or so before. And she's always smiling, always in this bubbly mood. I said, I don't know how she did it. It must be cool. So I got an inch and close to her. How you doing? Yeah. So anyway, we got friendly, you know, and I was scheduled to go away in February, April, April. And I was home showering. I'm ready to go. But getting ready, it, it, it hit me. I can't go. You know, every trip I took was with my late wife. I, I can't go. Bill Claude came over me. The phone rings. It's a style. I said, are you all right? You got everything? I said, look, I'm decided I go, go. A style encouraged me. She says, Denton, go. Enjoy yourself. We'll be praying. I'll be praying for you. You, you, you just go and, and, you know, get away from it all. It was only like a four or five day trip, but that's what happened. And I went and had the most wonderful time you ever had on your own with God. I had to do my studies, had the, had the, um, the, the curtains all drawn, the, the blackouts. And the very first night, I was there a couple of hours, and I finally opened the curtain, clear skies. This is like April, clear not a cloud in the sky. It was almost like God was talking to me. Now go outside. So I then had a wonderful time. Every single day, it was the same. Until the day I was leaving, and then I saw a cloud or two. But it was such a wonderful experience. And from that day, Asel and I got closer. And from the first day I took her home from church, we've been together ever since, every day. But you see how God, you know, putting God there, having God there in your heart from the beginning can help you when that, those types of situations happen. That's what it's about. It's not about a lot of the, the show and, the, and, the, and, the, and, and, and all of that stuff and, and being able to recite it. These things are wonderful. I'm not taking anything away from it. But the real test, God looks where? God looks on the heart. So you could do all these things. God sees the heart. So this is where we need the help. I just wanted to stop by. God is our help. He is the only one that can fix these broken hearts of ours. These hearts that will think selfishly, even though it looks like from somebody else's point of view that that person is a nice person. But all the while it's a selfish murder in there. He knows all this. He wants to fix us. Us getting to know God is the only way, our only chance, is our only hope. And that way, by beholding, you can become changed. You can accept that glory to glory into your own life. I'm sorry, I didn't use all my notes a lot. But amen. Amen, Father Denton. Thank you for the beautiful message and sharing your testimony. It's always so powerful when we hear how God can change us, how can He transform us, and and we can see the miracles in our lives through this, because He can change a stone heart to be a flesh heart. May God help us to, to acknowledge that we are all sinners and we are all in need of Jesus because this is our main problem when we start to get confident that we are okay, but we are not because we are all sinners and we are all in need of Jesus. So may God help us to humble ourselves and come for him to help because that's what he wants. He waits for us so he can help us and fix us. Um, let us stand for our closing hymn, singing hymn number 341. To God be the glory.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be in your presence at this moment. And we pray, Lord, that you will do what's necessary for each one of us. We know that we need clean new hearts of flesh that love you and love righteousness, Lord, and hate sin and sinning. But we can't do anything about it. So we come to you, heads bowed, standing in the back, pleading to you to fix us, transform us, Lord, and create in us those hearts that we need, that we will not just be able to serve you, but we represent to the world who you really are, that we will be the shining light that this world needs, that we will be the soul that the world needs as well, and that our lives will be a life lived in vain, but there be a life that's lived to bring glory and honor to you. We thank you, Lord, for this time. We pray for each one of us that you continue to bless us, that you have angels charge of each and every one of us, and that you will teach us, Lord, at your feet, the things we need to know. Thank you once again, Lord, for this time, and be with us through the week to come. Lord, we know the enemy, but we know you even more. So we put our faith and trust in you, no matter what he throws at us, Lord. Help us to learn whatever lesson that we need to learn that you have allowed him to have this access to us. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, thanksgiving. Amen. <laughs>